Father, and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, on today's date, April 11th, a little over a hundred years ago, a great saint left this world and entered eternity. And her name was Gemma Galgani. And we would like today to take advantage of this, this anniversary of her death to say a few words about this remarkable young woman who unfortunately is not very well known. And yet she is a saint special for our times for several reasons. First of all, precisely because she did not live that long ago. Sometimes the saints, when we, we hear about them, they're kind of lost in the Middle Ages or in the early Christian times and they don't have the same effect on us. But when, but when we have these saints like St. Pius X or, or St. Therese of Lisieux, these saints which we have pictures of them, we have a much, many more first accounts of them, it's, it's more striking for us and, it's more, and they are, for that reason they are more closer to us. And also with regard to St. Gemma, the other great saints whom we know to have received some of the extraordinary uh, gifts, the supernatural gifts which she received, they were either religious or living in the world, uh, public lives, which attracted attention or which at least attracted curiosity. But St. Gemma didn't belong to either one of these categories. Although she received many of these great favors, which we know are only given for, for the sake of others. God doesn't give these exceptional graces for, for the soul itself, but always to glorify Him and, to, and for the edification of others. But she, would, she did not live a public life, and, and neither was she able to become a religious, even though that was the one great desire of her life. Like the Archbishop, we could say that she never did what she wanted, but she was, providence always led her in that direction, which, uh, which in the end, of course, we see how God was greater glorified. So she lived an ordinary and a commonplace life. And lastly, another reason why it might be good for us to consider this great saint, because truly she is one of the greatest saints who ever lived. And that is not just my opinion. There, there are many uh, authors in the last century who, who say the same thing simply because of her, her, her phenomenal degree of charity towards the end of her life. And also these, these special graces which you receive. We know that God gives these graces. That, uh, the sanctity doesn't consist in them. We don't, have to be, we don't have to have these things in order to become a saint. But when God does give them, there is a sign of predilection there. And, and surely St. Gemma received, which just a historical fact, she received more than most of the saints. And even amongst the saints, only few of them received any of these graces. And yet she received arguably more than anyone. And so she is truly a great saint. And also, it wasn't by chance that we have this great saint in modern times. We, we know as, as, as the, the history of the world continues, the faith, charity is growing cold and the faith is being diminished. And even in 1903, when she died, uh, St. Pius X, just a few months later, St. Pius X would take the throne of St. Peter. And we know what he had to deal with. He was dealing with modernism, with rationalism, it's materialism. If you don't have, if we don't have scientific proof and we don't believe in it, even the divinity of our Lord was being doubted at that time. And so God raises up this great saint and these magnificent miracles and, and phenomena. If, and why not, if not to, to try to remind his church and, and indeed the whole world that, that God is close to us and that the supernatural world isn't that far. We live in a faithless time and St. Gemma can help us to remember these supernatural realities. Just as we have in the, the, the Gospel today, St. Thomas represents in a certain way the, uh, this, this faithlessness. He wanted to see our Lord. He wanted to put his hands into his side. If not, he wouldn't believe. And so also, this life of St. Gemma, it, it will allow us to, to have that contact with, with the divinity of our Lord and not, and, and not be so um, unbelieving as St. Thomas was even though we have not seen. And so first of all, we can start with just a, a biographical sketch of the life of St. Gemma. She was born on the 12th of March, 1878, in Camigliano, a village in Tuscany near the city of Lucca. Her parents were Henry Galgani, who was a, a successful chemist, and her mother was Aurelia of the noble house of Landi. 
And they were both very devout Catholics, and especially her mother was, was extremely holy and even known for her sanctity. They had eight children, five boys and three girls, but all but three of them died in their, in their youth. The name given to St. Gemma in her baptism, it, it was not a common name, but it, was, it, was, it seemed very providentially fitting. And the reason why her parents named her Gemma was because right before her birth, her mother experiences great joy. And, and afterwards, he, uh, also the father, when he, when he first saw her, he experienced also a, a great gladness. And they hadn't experienced this with any of their other children, and so they, um, they naturally considered her as a precious gift, and so they named her Gemma. And she remained precious in their eyes throughout her whole childhood because of her, um, her natural good dispositions. Certainly, um, some, some children are given more natural uh, dispositions towards uh, virtue, and St. Gemma was definitely favored this by God in, in, in a great degree. She was gentle, loving, calm, and, and pious, and then very docile to all those who, who spoke to her. Her parents found it hard not to, to show a certain favoritism towards her, and when they did, it, it actually caused St. Gemma uh, great distress. And she, even at a young age, she showed this humility. She didn't want to be singled out from the other children. And, and she said it caused her great suffering whenever her father and mother would show this, this, uh, this favoritism. And this is actually, during her whole life, this indeed was a, a characteristic of her. She, she detested that singularity and always tried to remain hidden. She had, Gemma had a special love for her saintly mother, and it was, it was truly from her mother she received this, uh, this very strong foundation which would allow her to become such a great saint. Since her mother herself was saintly, it's, we, we can see that, that influence, and, that, and her mother saw these dispositions, and so she spent extra time with her, in instructing her in the faith and in teaching her how to pray, and especially in telling her about our Lord and, and the Incarnation and what our Lord has done for us in, in the redemption. And St. Gemma was very struck with this when she was little, this, this reality of, of a God-made man who suffered for us. Gemma would also, oftentimes, she, she would never tire of hearing of these stories of our Lord, and she would, she would often, often follow her mother in the house when she was busy doing other things, and she would, and she would say, Mama, please tell me a little more about Jesus. But the greatest suffering of Gemma's childhood came when Providence took away this, this good mother when she was only seven years old. And thereby teaching St. Gemma at a young age the mystery of the cross and of detachment. Gemma continued to grow in, in, uh, in age and virtue and she was her father's consolation and helped with the family and taking care of the, of the other children. At school, she was loved by all, both the, the nuns who, who taught her and also the other students. And although she was very popular, she remained humble, and once again, she tried not to stand out in any way. As far as her temperament goes, she was, she was actually very vivacious and a very sanguine temperament, with, with a lot of energy. And yet, they say that she was very quiet because she constantly um, had to conquer herself. She never lost her temper or argued. And even when provoked, she always answered with an amiable glance and a smile. She was a very beautiful young girl. And they say that um, even though she tried to keep her eyes downcast, um, when people would look her in the eyes, it was hard to withstand her gaze. And she was also very intelligent. And even though she spent much of her time in prayer and solitude, she excelled in all of her studies and always finished at the top of her class. But during these years, there were still many crosses as, as St. Gemma grew in union with our Lord. We, we know there is no growth in the spiritual life without these crosses. And, and there were plenty. There were sicknesses and the misunderstandings. And in, in 1897, a heavy blow was dealt to the whole family. When her father lost his business and the family, they became destitute. And just a few months later, he and the father himself passed away. And so the children were left as orphans. The, the, the rest of the children had to go with, the, with some of the relatives, with the aunts, and St. Saint, Saint Gemma as well also went with them. And in these years, she is when she tried to enter a convent, as, which, as I mentioned, that was, that was the great dream of her life. She wanted to give her, give her life to her Lord. And yet because of either health reasons, or eventually because of, these, of, the, of the extraordinary graces she was receiving, 
she, she, and the publicity that started this, the cause, she wasn't able to do this. And in 1900, because some of the misunderstandings of what she was, what was the things that were happening to her, her aunt, her aunt didn't understand her or what, what was going on, and so she was forced to leave. And then she lived with a very good family, the Giannini family, until her death in 1903, when she died at the age of, of 25. And so in this short life, we have, we have so much. And I, I feel a little bit like St. Uh, John in the Gospel, he says, talking about our Lord, there's many things to, write, to talk about, to write about, but we can only mention a few of them. And so I'll try to be brief and, and first of all, perhaps speak about some of these extraordinary gifts that she receives and, and also some, some, of these, some of her virtues, which we can, or at least one virtue, which we can try to um, imitate in our own lives. These extraordinary graces and happenings in Gemma's life, they happened towards the end, from 1899 to 1903, so between the ages of 21 and 25. The first we could mention is the exceptional relationship which she had with her guardian angel, which is really remarkable. The first time she actually beheld her guardian angel was when she was 17. One of her relatives had given her some, some gold jewelry, and, and just, just to please her relatives, because even at that point she had already practiced great detachment, um, she decided to wear this jewelry on, on a, one night when she went out with her family. And when she came back, she was taken off the jewelry, and she, she saw her angel, who would, who would appear, of course, in, in, um, in, in a material way, so she could, she could see him. And he actually upbraided her for wearing this jewelry. And he, and he told her that a bride of Christ must have no other ornaments than the crown of thorns and, and the cross. Of course, it doesn't mean that jewelry in itself is wrong. It's just that St. Gemma was being called to a high degree of sanctity and, and the angel was trying to help her in becoming more detached to these things. So I'm not condemning jewelry. I just don't think that. Also, she talked with him regularly and even familiarly. And this was witnessed by many people, even her spiritual director, uh, Venerable German, Father Germanus, who wrote her life, says he himself even heard these, these conversations that she would have. And she would go into a sort of ecstasy whenever she talked to her guardian angel, and, and she would lose her senses. Whenever she looked at him or spoke with him, he said, he said you could touch her or, or, or pinch her or do anything, and she wouldn't even notice. But as soon as she turned away, then she would come back to herself. And so her angel would give her advice and, and give her instructions in the spiritual life, which oftentimes her first spiritual director wasn't able to give. And he even upbraided her for, um, for some of her faults. He defended her against the devil and, and comforted her, and he even went on errands for her. There are several times where St. Gemma would send him to tell people things, or to she even sent a couple letters, and until finally her spiritual director had to tell her to stop doing that. She would put, a, put the letter down somewhere, and then it would be gone, and, and, uh, but Father Germanus didn't think that was such a good idea. So her garden angel. But un- unfortunately, St. Gemma also had many unusual dealings with the devil himself. Who not only tempted her, but attacked her physically and mentally. Physically, he caused excruciating migraines and other pains so that she wouldn't be able to pray. He would attack her sometimes when she would try to write to her spiritual director to try to get some questions answered, uh, taking her pen and pulling her away from the desk. And, uh, and like the cure of ours, he would throw her against the wall sometimes and and often our Lord would allow him to torment her during, these, during long nights. And he would appear as hideous forms and, and beating her incessantly. He tried to appear as an angel of light to deceive her and even disguise himself once as her confessor. But all these she humbly accepted because she knew that our Lord only allows these for, for higher reasons and that, he wish, that our Lord would never allow the devil to do more than she could, than she could handle. And also, we should mention, in these last few years of her life, once she, re- when she reached uh, this mystical union, of course, she passed through all the stages in the spiritual life. And once she reached that stage, it was a very common thing for her to go into ecstasy, and, and she was favored with many apparitions. And when she was in this state of ecstasy, uh, there's many witnesses who give account of this. And they said they could barely look at her because she was so, uh, so resplendent. And... And, uh, and they said that her face was like that of an angel. 
And, and as far as the apparitions go, she not only had several apparitions with Our Lady and, and many of the saints, especially St. Gabriel Vicente, the, the Passionist Father, but also from, from the time she was 18, she merited to not only hear the voice of our Lord, but also to gaze at Him and to speak with Him. Our Lord, who was her spouse and her king. Then la- and lastly, I would like to mention some of the, some of the incredible sufferings of, of St. Gemma. The sufferings which she experienced in, um, in union with our Lord, who, in the sufferings of His passion. We might say that, that our Lord's passion was the spirituality of St. Gemma. It was her constant uh, meditation and, and her prayer. And, that's, and it was really the, the, um, it was the source of her generosity. And this, this too, I think we must also, this is what we can also learn from her. It was her, con- these sufferings, so they were her constant meditation and she, and through begging our Lord, she actually experienced every single one of them. In 1899, she received the stigmata. And from Thursday night until Friday afternoon, uh, blood would pour forth from her hands and from her side. And it, of course, it caused her great embarrassment, and she did everything she could to try to hide it. But of course, especially with her family, it, w- it was impossible. In 1900, while she was in ecstasy, she had a vision of Christ in his agony. And, and she was so str- and so taken by our Lord's uh, sadness and, and, his, and his soul being pierced that she begged that she might be able to suffer something of his agony, and so she did. He also placed on her at one point, once again at, at her request, his crown of thorns. And also with the stigmata, she, sometimes people would see, she would, uh, uh, there would be, she would be shown wounds on her head, just as in the, uh, of the crown of thorns, all over her head, like in, like in the shape of a helmet, as, it, as most authors say that it was. Several times she sweated blood, especially whenever she heard, she would even sweat blood whenever she heard blasphemies, whether it was in the street or one time at home, someone spoke disrespectfully about our Lord, and it caused her so much suffering that she fainted, and, and before that she even sweated blood. She also had the open wound on her left shoulder from the cross. And perhaps the most extraordinary of these, of these sufferings or of the passion which she experienced for the with the, with the lacerations of the scourge of the pillar. Um, many people also saw this and they said it was really terrible to behold. On, on her neck and her back and on, also on her leg, she had these deep gashes, like her Lord, which even showed the down, or down to the bone. And so we see this, this amazing generosity on the part of St. Gemma, this devotion to the Passion. I think that is really um, one of the secrets to the saints. Of course, of course, many of us, are, or most of us, will never have any of these extraordinary things happen, but all of us are meant to, to um, keep the passion before our eyes. And, it was, and that was really the, the, the secret of many of the saints. Now, St. Teresa of Avila said that she didn't begin on the road to sanctity until she considered more what our Lord did for her in the passion. And just, and just to give you a couple of quotes of St. Gemma before we finish. Um, our Lord also often talked to her about the, 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 the secret of, 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 of love, which was, he said, one, learn, one learns how to love by learning how to suffer. And he told her, Do you know, daughter, for what reason I send crosses to souls dear to me? I desire to possess their souls entirely, and for, this, and for this reason I surround them with crosses and enclose them in tribulation. Oh, how many souls would have been lost if they had not been crucified? And also St. Gemma herself tells us, no, I do not refuse the cross, because if I refuse the cross, I refuse Jesus also. Holy cross, with you I want to live. With you I want to die. I love the cross because I know the cross is on the shoulder of Jesus. O cross, near you I feel very strong. I solicit continually the love of the cross, not yours, my Savior, but the, the one you wish me to embrace. I love it. I love it very much. It is, it is on the cross, Jesus, that I have learned to love you. And so let us pray to St. Gemma today on, on her feast day and, and ask her to give us that generosity and, and to consider from time to time our Lord's passion that we may also, in considering what He has done for us, also try to carry our own cross and to grow in the, in the, in the virtue every day. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.